Michael Jordan documentary. My friend Jason Hare is doing for ESPN. It launches next Sunday. It's 10 parts. It is two parts um, per night for five straight Sunday nights. First episode on Sunday night is kind of an overview. It's all based in this 97, 98, his last dance, his last season on the Bulls. And then it goes backwards, jumps around, does a whole bunch of things. Second episode um, dives into that season more and does a lot of Scotty Pippen stuff. So be ready for that. But um, look, even though it's 10 hours, the Jordan story, like there's some real basketball nerd stuff I think we can have fun with here. I thought that over the next six podcasts, starting with tonight, we could pick an MJ game each Sunday and kind of dive into it and explain why we think this was a formative MJ experience game. So the first one we did, which I asked you if we could do because I felt pretty strongly about it, is game three of the 91 finals. And I think when people talk about the formative first seven years of Jordan's career, first eight years, they always go to the 63-point game against the Celtics. That was his arrival game. Uh, The shot against Cleveland. They go to when they, when they finally beat Detroit and then it kind of just fast forwards to game five in 91. And it's like, and, and Phil told Michael, he's got to trust his teammates. Who's open. Pax is open. The famous story. He starts throwing it to Pax and Pax and makes some jumpers. They win the title. He's cradling the trophy. Game three has been lost in the annals of NBA history. And I'm not exactly sure why. So when I texted you, I want to do this game. What was your reaction? I was surprised, but I'm glad because I hadn't thought about it in forever. Um, And it's coming off of a game two where Jordan was basically perfect in the game. Um, He was 15 to 18, hit 13 straight, and And they left Chicago. Right. And and And, he made the, oh, a spectacular move by Jordan. The Marv Albert call. Thank you. And so they win that one 107-86. And... You're headed back to LA split. And well, I think let's go back further though. So okay. previous year, 1990 blazers, pistons, final good series. People are kind of bummed out. It was the first time we had not had uh magic or bird in a finals basically since 1980. And you know, nobody really liked the bad boy Pistons. I know that they there's been a, a turn, you know, recently they they've, I think people have warmed up to them, but back then people were like, fuck those guys, those guys, we, we just want to see the Celtics and the Lakers or the bulls and the Lakers, or whatever the Pistons were kind of in the way blazers knocked the Lakers out in 90 and 90, the 91 season. Can I just jump in on that Pistons thing? Like Isaiah Thomas is one of the most underrated players. I think in NBA history, Yes. He was just filthy. And think about that team, like the way it was constructed. Um, and look, Vinny got it going, and Dumars had some big games. But there were so many times Isaiah had to kind of bail them out sometimes offensively, especially in a, in a more physical era as a smaller player, how small he was. But Isaiah does this thing where it's like, well, nobody likes us because we beat Bird, we beat Magic, and we beat MJ, and no one likes us, and that's why we're not remembered as much. No, the problem is, is that you're swimming in this neighborhood that's absurd. The 80s Celtics and Lakers. And then Jordan, six and eight years. And you're back to back in that little window. It's only two. When when it magics in nine of 12 finals, Bird's got his three, MJ's got his six. Like, that's just the way it works. Like, sometimes we're as basic as counters. And it's not even an anti-Detroit thing, which there's plenty of anti-Detroit out there. But it's not like, like putting you fourth in those 20 years is exactly where you belong. Right. They had a little Larry Holmes syndrome. Yes. So what about me? What about me? And it's like, well, you're following Muhammad Ali. Sorry. We're, we're not going to get as right. excited yeah. about you. We're just not. Uh, so we have this 91 finals and it just works out. All of a sudden it's Bulls Lakers. Magic is still throwing a hundred miles an hour. He's still fucking awesome. MJ, we were so fired up to finally get him in the finals and he gets there. As it turns out, it is, uh, it's the only Lakers finals of the 1990s. It's the last one ever at the forum. It's the last game three is the last great 
Magic Johnson game that he was involved in, like the last, the last game you would see in a hardwood classic game five wasn't, even though the bulls won the title, that wasn't a great game. Um, this was year one of NBA on NBC where the halftime show, I don't know if you watched, but it was Bob Costas and Pat Riley. Pat Riley is like the best person who's ever done studio in an NBA game. He was unbelievable. It was such a loss when he went back to coaching, he was lights out. Marv and the czar were great. Marv's thrown 130 miles an hour this year. Ahmad, this is his first year as a sideline reporter, John Tesh. And then on top of all this, don't forget I, Steve snapper Jones. Yeah. And the snapper, um, you also had really awesome season. So 90, 91, it's the last year where bird and magic both had legit chances to win the title. It was the year Jordan became the man. Uh, you had a really dramatic final four because Pistons Bulls, even though it was only a four game sweep, people were, that was, that was the trilogy. People were fired up for that. LA Portland round two was also great. Uh, there were some great earlier series, Celtics Pacers, bird, bird against person, Reggie Miller, Celtics Pistons was great that year. 76ers versus the Bulls. It was Barkley apex Barkley, uh, warriors, LA, the TMC warriors. That was really fun too. And then I just wrote down all the great people that were playing this season. So for Hall of Famers, MJ, Magic, Larry, Isaiah, Hakeem, Drexler, Barkley, Malone, Stockton, McHale, Parrish, Robinson, Ewing, Worthy, Dumars, and Rodman. But then you have ascending on the green hour pointing up, Pippen, Gary Payton, and Sean Kemp, Reggie Miller, the TMC Warriors, KG, KJ and Hornacek. All those guys are in the playoffs. Like the league's fucking loaded. This was before expansion. It's tight and it's just an awesome season and everything crests with this Bulls Lakers series. You must, you must remember this back when, right? Yeah. And you know, I meant to ask you though, cause you, I don't want to put you on the spot here because I was looking up everybody's seedings and it's funny that we were on the same exact page. Cause you thought I was going to like get right into it. And I wrote everybody's playoff down, like in what they had done the year before. Cause I was like, wait a minute. Cause the, the Bulls ran through everybody in this playoff year, they did. which I think is important to bring up three Oh sweep against the Knicks. And that Knicks team wasn't fully constructed. Like Ewing had a bad yeah. series, 4-1 against Philly. They swept Detroit. That Detroit team had nine fewer wins than the previous year. And so when you go back to that previous year, you know they had lost in seven the Bulls had in 1990 to a Detroit team that won 59 games. You're like, okay, Detroit's taking a pretty big step back. Um, and this Bulls team won 61 games. So I'm like, okay, so where were the Lakers going in all this? You know, they win in seven against Detroit. They get swept by Detroit. And Detroit felt like they had lost that one. Like, 88 should have been theirs. Right. Um, it all evened out. And if, it, yeah, and it evens out. But, I mean, it just, I think even a Lakers fan, if you're being honest, in 88, it's like, we got one here that maybe we shouldn't have. And Detroit was so pissed off about it the entire year that that's probably Detroit thinking they should have had a third one. What the hell happened in 90 when the Lakers were 63 and 19 and got blasted in the second round by the Phoenix Suns? Because I went back and looked at so, it, and there weren't. Go ahead. Um, one of the great underrated playoff upsets that is never brought up or mentioned. Never. Ever. Phoenix was a five seed. It was just KJ and Hornacek and Chambers and this weird Phoenix team. And it was just a bad matchup for the Lakers. And the Lakers, I think, had Riley at either right was Riley gone? I think he was. And they had Randy That's Fund what I'm as the coach. Yeah. So that weird coach thing. Magic was the MVP that season. Um, it was just a bad matchup, but all of a sudden they lost the series. So um, at that point, people thought, oh, are the Lakers done? Then they just retool. They get Perkins. They get Vlade Divac. And all of a sudden have this uh, really kind of funky, unconventional physical team that when you're watching the series, like the amount, like the, this game three, the amount of low post stuff was bonkers. But um Couple other things. It was still quickly. Riley, by the way. It fun was on the staff. In Riley. Yeah, I mean, they went 63 and 19. And I was looking at the stats because I was like, wait a minute, is there an injury that I'm missing here? They lost to Phoenix in five games. KJ went off. Yeah, he, he went just nuts. absolutely went off. But yeah, that's that is a very I mean, again, who I mean, you know, the grand scheme of things, who cares about this? That stuff was the secret. Idea, but. This Achilles heel of that Lakers team was stopping point guards. Because even the sleepy Floyd game, the famous game when he just went completely out of his mind in the, uh, in the 87 series, but Tim Hardaway, uh, KJ, Isaiah, these guys would let go off. They didn't really have, it would be basically Byron Scott, Byron or, Scott Cooper, yeah. or Cooper trying to guard these guys. 
Uh, you mentioned the 91 Bulls, how they ripped through people. So their last 37 games, they were 30 and seven. They, they were 61 team that year, but they were 30 and seven. They really kind of came together the second half of the year, 15 and two in the playoffs, nine double digit wins. They only lost two games in the playoffs. One was an overtime game three against Barkley and the Sixers. The other was game one of the finals, which was a last second three by Sam Perkins. And MJ missed wide open jumpers to win both of those games. So they legitimately could have gone undefeated in the playoffs. Um, they also, they swept the back-to-back -back champs, the Pistons, and murdered that team. They, they killed that team. That team was done. Then they, uh, they basically swept the Lakers because they lost game one. They won the next four, and that ended showtime. Magic retired uh, a few months later. And, uh, and that I should also mention I lost money on this game. I'd started gambling a year before and we thought for sure Lakers at home. I think they were favored by like two and a half, something like that. We're like, Oh yeah. And, uh, got kicked in the nuts by the, uh, by the MJ era. But, um, game one Lakers win huge Perkins three MJ missed the game winner game two. He had tones. Awesome. But they also put Pippen on magic that game. Pippen's hounding them. They're taking turn. They're tag team and magic all the way up the court MJ, but then a lot of Pippen, and they're just trying to wear him down. And it's working. When you were watching this in game three, did it make you wonder why every team didn't do this to magic? Or was this an older magic? Well, it isn't an older magic though. Like he's still 31. only what, 31. So yeah. we can talk about the tread. I, I, I left this game going. Good magic is the best. It's so, Oh my God. Fun. I felt the same it's way. So it's so funny. It's not that I've ever had a moment where I'm driving around going, Hey, do you underrate magic? And I'm thinking, no, I've never, like, I've always been very no, pro magic. I think we like, do. Oh, yeah. I think he's underrated. But, but, but then again, I, I see these things, you go, it's just so stupid. Like no one does what he does because even LeBron at his size, right? LeBron being this big point guard at, at, for really long stretches, the way magic would just back you down and his post moves are as good as anyone. I'm not talking like magic's post moves. What he could have done, like Magic could have been so many different players. So if we're just going to do the Magic thing here now because we can't help ourselves, I'm all for it. Because yeah. in my craziest phases, look, MJ's the best ever, okay? The oddity of these insecure Jordan fans, it's like, you know, most people actually just concede that he's the best. Like you're arguing this position that almost no one else wants to argue. And there's moments with MJ in this game that we'll bring up where you're like, this is kind of why people look at him and say he's on a different level. But what I would do when I was younger and try to challenge this stuff all the time, I go, you know, if you really want to break it down, what if you said you could have five of any players, five on five? So five cloned guys against any other five. And I would take in the clone conversation, which is obviously totally made up, five magics. Because magic really could have done anything he wanted. He's a 6'9 point guard that's overpowering everybody, and he's backing you down with this dribble where his ass is right on you the whole time, and you can't do anything. And if he gets you deep enough for the post, he ate up Jordan. Every time he had Jordan single in the post, he, he killed them. And, you know, look, that's just a size difference. And that was something that actually the Lakers are doing throughout this game. His passing out of the post, his reading of the double, all of the stuff that he did, obviously this goes back to when Kareem was hurt in the Sixers and he's a rookie and goes crazy in game six, but Magic could have done anything he wanted at any time, and it just happened to be that he always had these other good players. It's like, so you don't need to shoot as much. We need you to initiate the offense, but this game is like an awesome, except late, it gets a little frustrating, but there's so many moments in this game where you just sit back, and I was howling watching Magic play again because it was just fun to watch Magic Johnson. I'm with you. I, I had him in my book. I had him fourth. It's too low. Bird. No, <laughs> yeah, you know, he's and, and then LeBron, he kept going when LeBron won in 16 and you're like, okay, now it's probably Jordan one, LeBron two, Russell three, something like that. But I, after watching, I hadn't really sat down and watched a vintage magic game in a while. And I'm just thinking like, honestly, to argue magic versus LeBron is ludicrous. Both of those magic was fucking unbelievable. He was every bit as good as LeBron. He just didn't play as long. His career. No, he didn't. And, and it was, and it's it was different. a 12 year career instead of an 18 year career or whatever LeBron's going to end up with. But God damn magic was unstoppable. He, unstoppable. So magic's post moves like his spin baseline how Either way, quick that was yeah. Both I mean, he could, he could he could bring you hook shots across the middle, and 
you know, one of the things that was kind of the key theme in this game, if we go basketball nerdish, is that Chicago was big on doubling on the catch. You know, different teams do different things. They, they double. Like, rarely you're going to see an NBA team just straight up double somebody in the post all the time. But they double on the catch. And they'd send, like, Jordan loved that stuff. The stuff where he, you know, years later swipes Carl Malone because he comes baseline because Malone takes too long. And you should have seen that because that's something MJ loved to do. He'd, he'd sneak off you and come baseline. But the third guy needs to pay attention to what that rotation is off the double. And the Bulls, as impressive as they were defensively, because they have moments in this game you're like, this group, man, swarming Fourth everything. quarter overtime was, uh, yeah, just ridiculous. Stupid. Like, the Bulls' ridiculous. intensity defensively, it, this is something you should be showing kids, right, if you're a high school coach, how special that was. But they sucked off the double with the third guy, and Magic ate him up. And even Divots, who you're reminded, like, holy shit, like, that guy was so skilled. They, yeah. when, La when the Lakers would get it rolling, Chicago was stuck in this doubling the post catch where they were constantly getting burned on it because Magic was seeing everything and then Magic would add his little flair to it. But yeah, there are really long stretches here and they get up. I mean, I don't want to get too far ahead because I know how you're kind of running this. Can I thing, do one but... thing on that though? Yeah. The, the thing that jumped out of me, because I hadn't really watched a Magic game intently in a while. He, by, by like 87 he adds this low post element in this back down thing and just gets better at every year. And he wins the MVP in 87 and 89 and 90 and is every bit as good as, as Jordan offensively. Jordan, I think was a better all around player, but you watch the spacing knowing what we know now watching this game. And you have this completely unstoppable magic backing down guys where it's like, there's no answer to this because if you double team him, he will he will find the right guy to pass to. If you have cutters, you're getting a layup or a dunk. And yet the Lakers didn't understand the spacing part. So they have like first of all, they didn't make a three pointer in this game. There's only one no, both for teams five. went one for eleven total in these three pointers. Like now, if you took this Laker team, you'd been like, okay, like if we went in a time machine after game three and, and just were able to talk to Mike Dunleavy, you'd be like, okay, here's what you do. Put Byron Scott in the corner. Just keep him there. Just trust me. Just keep him there and tell him all he does is shoot corner threes. Put Sam Perkins at the top. Just put him there. And then put any shooter in the other corner and just let Magic cook. Say, like, just let him do his thing. He'll find guys. Just trust me. But they didn't know how to do that. And it's like so cluttered. And in that fourth quarter in the OT, the Bulls were just so fantastic defensively. They were just able to swarm. Everybody's within 15 feet of each other. There's no spacing at all. But I'm with you. I The magic spin moves to both sides, it's unbelievable. He's so good. I He's urge so everybody good. to watch this. I really now, enjoyed it. God, I fucking loved watching that guy. Uh, I, I was like, I got up and kind of, it was weird. Like I watched the first quarter and got up, was like, this is awesome. <laughs> I'm just so glad. Like I took a break because I was having almost too much fun and I wasn't paying enough attention. And um And by the know, way, the we should mention he doesn't have like it's not like he's, you know, no, incredible no. in this game. Like this is what did he Oh, he, he had, had those like he had like one of those on his way to a big triple double first halves, but then they really from the third late third quarter on they they fell apart in this one. Can can we go to back He's to one 20, thing though? Like, 22, 22, 10, and six. Typical yeah, magic stats. But it wasn't yeah. like an awesome game or anything. Anyway, go ahead. I think one of the most important things when you go into this game, though, is trying to watch it through the prism of what we're talking about. MJ's in his seventh year, okay? And I've said this often, but if MJ were a player today, putting up the numbers he put up, he would get trashed by 50% of the media. Because he hadn't won yet. You thought LeBron had it bad. If MJ had had his numbers and losing in the playoffs, it, it would have been, hey, you know, year six. Oh, MJ. But he, yeah, he was score. getting it, though. But he was getting it. It was he just was we had less it. ways to yeah, get it. Right. We, Absolutely. we didn't have the same. We didn't have first take back then. If we had first take, it would have been the topic every day. Absolutely. And you know what? We know our dads were like, probably specifically your dad and my dad, we're like, yeah, you know, whatever, 63 points and a loss, you know, probably doing that oh, kind yeah. of stuff. By the so, way, I was doing that too. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to, you can't watch this of, hey, this is the guy who's got six rings. This is the guy with zero rings. And this is a Lakers team that's been in the finals basically for a decade straight. And yes, it's starting to leak a little bit here, but Magic is still, you know, arguably the, the second best player to Jordan being the best player in the league at this time. 
And they play on this theme a lot with Marv Albert, who you're right, is throwing absolute 99 on the paint in this so game. Good. So where good. Where there was a moment where Jordan doesn't miss a shot for 13 attempts in game two. He hits 13 straight shots. And there was this thing where he had looked to the Lakers bench and Byron Scott got all upset about it, right? Byron Scott's like, he's taunting us. And he, I thought he kind of was taunting them. And then MJ sat down and was like, I wasn't taunting anybody. Of course, NBC never shows a replay of it, ever. The lack of replays in this finals, it was tough. And you could kind of tell it was NBC's first year with it. But there was also another moment in this game where they missed a block. They just missed the play in the commercial altogether. And then Marv's like, hey, there was a block and Terry Teagle's at the free throw line. So you didn't miss. Sorry. Much. Yeah. Right. And then the guy who made that directing decision went on to do Nesson games for the Red Sox for a decade. Right. Well, because <laughs> right. it's like, yeah, that guy, like, that guy <laughs> got shut out. Well, well you I'm know. just saying like Nesson does this thing. It's like walk off home run. All right. First, this place that supplies paper. <laughs> <laughs> brings you coffee and we'll, and we'll get to the walk off home run right after Tom Karen, you know, and you're like, right. Jesus, like every Red Sox game I watch, like every big play, it's like, we're seriously going to commercial already. Um, the point, and I'll make, I'm going to finish here on this point because I'm dragging it out, but Byron Scott's looking at and when he looks in the mirror, he's thinking a handful of rings. We're in the finals. We're the freaking Lakers. And this is MJ who hasn't won shit who, yeah, you made a bunch of shots. But, like, don't talk to us that way. That seems inconceivable that an opponent would be saying MJ shouldn't be taunting us on the bench after making 13 straight, but it's still so early. Like, this is the stage two or act two, whatever, of Jordan's NBA career where I thought that storyline that they kept revisiting in the broadcast was just really funny to think about because that's not the way we've ever consumed Jordan. But at that time, Byron Scott thinks he's right. And, he, you know, because he's like, who is this guy? I think he is looking at us like we're one, one in the finals going back to L.A. We just split like we're going to beat you guys. Yeah, there was some institutional arrogance from the 80s. And, and I had kind of forgotten a lot of it where people just loved the Celtics and Lakers and that whole thing. And it was like it saved basketball in a lot of ways. Magic and Bird, I think, were two of the most likable players for other fans from other teams who are just like, wow, I just really enjoy watching these guys. They go at it in the 84, 85, 87 finals. They're widely credited as basically saving the NBA and pushing it to another level. So I went back and I read Jack McCallum's piece after game four, the next game. So Sports Illustrated's closing on a Sunday. Game four was on a Sunday. So he's writing that piece. And he kind of goes into this whole thing about like, oh man, this MJ thing. And this is a paragraph he writes. The flip side to Jordan's great gift of inspiring wonder is that he invariably inspires jealousy and resentment too. And champion or not, he cannot match the Pied Piper popularity of magic. There is a little bit of an anti-Jordan undertone to this, traceable to some Laker players and to some members of the media, almost as if Jordan must be torn down so that magic can remain on top. It shouldn't be that way. There's room for both. So. I we're trying to make this point here, but this is this is how everyone felt at the time. It was kind of like fuck this guy. This is still Magic and Bird's league, and we had Bird on the Celtics. We're in the fucking back brace, trying to make it to the finals again, almost doing it. And then you have Magic, like with these new teammates, all this stuff, still unbelievable to watch. And he has a chance to win another finals, and and Jordan and Pippen are like the bad guys. And now and and they're eight young. Years, it flips. If all those guys, right, they're so young too. Like when they're being introduced, you go, okay, Jordan's in his seventh year. Like he's Pippen's only a few years into Pippen's the league. A baby Grant, in this game, yeah. Horace Grant, you know, is young. And those are their three best guys. Like that's actually kind of back, you know, growing up when we were watching these games, that's a young group to win an NBA title, even though Jordan's been were in the league for seven years. Really, really crazy athletic. And so, you know, that Pistons team, when they started coming up in the late 80s and they were able to throw you know, Rodman out there with Isaiah and Dumars. And I, I remember when Rodman really started guarding bird, you know, my favorite player of all time and just being like, kind of nervous, like, Oh man, <laughs> what's this, this guy bird bird, like can't go by this guy. <laughs> what's going on. He was just at a whole other level of athleticism. And then you see like Pippen and Grant and then even like guys off the bench, like cliff Levingston's a beast in this game. But, uh, I, 
this Bulls team was really good. The 92 version was probably, you know, they had a little more confidence. I think Pippen was better. Um, but I think this run they had was probably the best of all those three first title seasons. Pretty so unstoppable. The the weird thing about this game is that once <laughs> he's want to talk about spacing and stuff. Like when every time I see Bill Cartwright get a touch in this game, I'm like, okay, it's just a waste of a possession because it's never really set up. It's just, hey, it's Bill's turn to shoot. It's the old inside out thing, but nobody's shooting. Nobody, the Lakers have no shooting, by the way. They get destroyed on the boards because of that athleticism you're talking about. They played a bunch of different centers. Even the Bulls, I mean, Stacey King comes in and Marv's like, there's talk about his weight issues and, uh, you know, he's not happy telling Phil Jackson. He's right. not happy about his minutes. Out of shape to enter the league. I mean, Marv has a heater in this game where they're talking Vladi, and he goes to Fratello and he says, Well, you see, Magic talking to Vladi. And Vladi encourages that. He says he keeps him straight. He goes, But some would argue part of that European mentality floating from game to game, not a ton of intensity. Coach, oh, Czar, I, I is, that. Is, is that fair? Like, he just straight up in the middle of a finals game is like, <laughs> People say the Euros are soft and flighty, Czar. Your thoughts. And Zar's it, like, yeah, it's, it, it is true. <laughs> he ag Fratello agreed with him. I know. Imagine like, that happening in a broadcast now. <laughs> Fratello's like, well, you know, they don't have to go this hard over there. Like, <laughs> And then he went language to, to fully tell the story. Fratello's like, you know, there's a language barrier. You, you, you wonder at times if they know the plays. Um, and look. Dirk got shit on forever. I mean, he was just another big soft hero. So in the in the in the few years of everyone being like a heightened sensitivity about any way we talk about anything, like just to go back 30 years and Marv in the middle of this. And by the way, Vladdy was awesome in this game. He was well, unbelievable. They, He's 22 he years was, old. He was fantastic. But it was funny. They were making it seem like he had like a translator on the sidelines. I'm pretty sure he could speak English back then. Yeah, guys were talking <laughs> to him. But he's just he's bringing the ball up. And he goes, Czar, there are the, the Euros. <laughs> I, could I love that part, too. Is... So the, uh, the quick recap of this game, the Lakers went up 13 midway through the third quarter. They're pounding Chicago down low. Philly, Chicago's doing some weird things. Phil Jackson, like he's got Jordan on Divach. I didn't really totally understand that one. I didn't. Uh, and he got eaten I, up. He got eaten up, by the way. Like it was really Divac weird. was great against it. Yeah, and weren't you thinking, I'm going to let you finish, but this is the moment where in the, like if you were watching this live in 1991, you're like, okay, this series is over. Like oh, you're if you, watching or if you going, bet on the Lakers in game three, you're <laughs> like, okay, I, I hit this one. In that. No, you didn't. But they have an 18-2 to two run. Phil calls three timeouts during the run, and they can't stop it. It's 67, 54, five minutes left. Jordan's just bad up to this point. Marv even says, Michael Jordan has been off his game to this point. Uh, Divac had 21 he through the third quarter. Bulls come back a little bit. They're down six after three. And it's like... For some reason, Jordan or or Magic are just not coming out. The, the guys are just leaving them. They both play over 50 minutes in this game. Phil finally takes out Jordan with like six minutes left, brings in Cliff Levingston. No, it's four. But this is insane. Or, or five minutes. You're left. talking about the fourth yeah. quarter, right? Yeah. There's I, you know, we don't have they don't have the graphic in this this broadcast, so it was hard to take notes and be like, but about four plus minutes, he sat MJ. In game three of a possession game, he sits him down at four plus and puts him back in like was a minute white. and a half, two minutes later. Right. Yeah, because he he missed like two in traffic layups that he would make he had, every time. You just tell he had no legs. He had one field goal made over 20 minutes. So if you go back to watch this thing thinking you're getting some 40 point MJ masterpiece, that's not what this is. So, all right. So why do we pick this game as one of the six important MJ games? So the Bulls are up three, two minutes left. Grant loses it. Magic does a fucking unbelievable lefty spin move. I wrote magic fucking unbelievable lefty spin move in my notes. Uh, I have the same notes. Three Bulls offensive rebounds. Grant put back. They run the graphic. 40 to 25 Bulls rebounds. Perkins makes a driving hook. Lakers are now down one with a minute left. Comes down to MJ. Bricks a jumper. Bricks it like it's like a backboard. It just comes flying off. Lakers come back down. They're really swarming magic from far away, trying to not let him do anything. He throws a divot. You kind of lose it, picks it up, 
stumbles in, makes this amazing layup and gets fouled and does the famous thing where he runs over to Magic with his hands down and jumps into Magic. It was really funny. It was, it was so idolized Magic. You just tell Magic hugs him. It's They're a bad pass two. by Magic, by the way. It was, it was, it was sloppy. And he, yeah, the whole thing got messed up. Lakers up two, 11 seconds left. NBC gives Vlade Divac the Miller Light player of the game. Do you notice that? I had come a out of a broadcast. timeout. Marv's like, the Miller Light player of the game is Vlade Divac, 24 and six. And I, I'm like, uh, the Bulls are really down too. Not so bad they, for an, uh, a Euro that lacks intensity and focus. <laughs> He'll drink this, these beers lackadaisically like he does everything else. Someone may have to tell him it's a beer and not milk. He, the language barrier being what it is. <laughs> so uh, the Bulls take it out from under the Lakers basket. MJ goes coast to coast, beats two guys. Divac comes over, little jumper, makes it with four seconds left. And I think, honestly, up to that point of his career, this is the biggest shot of his career. People would go... The, the quote unquote, the shot over Cleveland. Fine. They won a best of five series against Cleveland. They lost the next <laughs> round, the 63 point game. They lost. They, they, the Celtics beat them like a drum in 86, 97. Uh, anything else you want to give me in 89, 90 didn't really matter. They didn't go anywhere. This game, if he misses that shot, they're playing two days later on a Sunday. He's, he's just had a shitty game. Everybody's like, wow, Michael Jordan doesn't have it. Not tough enough. Doesn't choked, choked stage a little too big for him. It's still magic and birds league. Now there's all this pressure on that game four. And there was a possibility where he could have like kind of gone to the dark side. It done like a Kobe 2010 game seven. Like I'm, I'm winning this game. I don't need teammates anymore. Um, the fact that this shot went in sets everything up that happens for the rest of the decade for him. Now, would it have happened anyway? Probably. Yes. But, um, Maybe even definitely, but I don't know if it would have happened in this series. I do think this series could have flipped if the Lakers win this game. I, I think it could have been very similar to that 88 finals where the Pistons lose the series and you're just like, what the fuck just happened? Pistons were better. How did they not win that? It did have the potential because they blew game one too. He makes it Lakers blow the out of bounds pass goes to OT. The rest is history. Um, so on, on that play, and, and you're right, there's this really long stretch. As I said, one field goal over 20 minutes. Marv's letting MJ have it. This is before MJ God status on NBC. Marv is constantly reminding you how bad MJ's been playing. And that third quarter is just so weird because it looks like Magic and the Lakers are going to run him out of the building. The forum was oddly quiet for a game that went into the night. I thought it yeah. had like real lulls throughout the broadcast. And then you're like, okay, you know, the Chicago team, probably too young, their first year in the finals, you know, all the stuff people thought ahead of time. And I do think the Lakers were favored in Vegas to win this series from what I they was were. able to. But I, okay. So that shot after Vladdy's got this absurd and one and, and Chicago grinded to get this thing. Even it wasn't some awesome run like you just keep looking down and you're like wait they're down eight. Oh, they're down six they cut this thing to four like how did this team cut it to four at the end of the third quarter and put together this run and a lot of it was rebounding and despite what i didn't like about their double teams and some of the weird isos where vladi got mj in the post single covered the way you mentioned they would not only attack magic but they started full court pressing they were running traps. Magic at 6'9 dribbled through a trap where it looked like he was going to get stuck back court on a violation. And just seeing him get through that trap, I'm like, I can't believe a 6'9 guy just dribbled through this trap. But what Chicago was doing a lot like what we see in so many playoff teams in, in recent basketball is they blitz the point guard off the screen. So bring the two up. And it's not that we think we stopped everything, but we're delaying you getting into your 24-second shot clock. Eight seconds over, another five or six seconds. You know, and Now maybe you're actually face, facing the basket and ready to go, but you only get eight seconds left on the shot clock. And Chicago was doing that a lot. And it was just so impressive. And then you think of like how you'd want to build a team. You'd want really good offensive players that are long, that are also multiple on defense. I just went Canadian pronunciation because I'm so excited about this. But to see defense. Pippen and Jordan running around and just jumping into all these passing lanes. And you're right. Like Levingston has great moments off of the bench here. So and Grant Grant's the and other Grant, one. Grant's so yeah. And Grant's probably just criminally underrated too. But then it's like, well, what is he a superstar? You're like, no, he isn't. Cause that's the other thing is where, when I'm looking at these rosters, I go, who's the third guy for LA? Cause worthy 
has overall decent numbers and he has some big shots, but then you look at it and they're like, oh, well, he, he was hurt. Like, okay, how he hurt was he? A, started to move into a different phase of his career right around here. I, he, had the, he had all the North Carolina years and then all those Laker years where they're just playing 95 game seasons every year. And right, I, I think right. his, his career and the Riley practices were legendary, these three hour practices. And I, I, you look at his career and you think like, why didn't that guy play for 18 years? I think he played. Oh, he's done early. Like, yeah, he was done yeah. within 10. Back then, when you were like 31, did you go, okay, you're probably going to be done at 33, and that's just kind of the way it works. So, no look, trainers, as, as any of that stuff. I, I just think in the game, you're going, there's this level of intensity that Chicago's bringing where the athleticism is an advantage, and the Lakers have no shooting. They have none. Byron Scott's terrible in this game. He misses every single eight. shot that he takes. Yeah. So on that last play, I've also seen people like, hey, you got to double him. And you're like, okay, you could have doubled him in a way where you don't let him bring up the ball, but that is taking all the credit away from how tough that shot was that he hits. Because Byron does a really good job on him late on a couple of those possessions when MJ's still missing shots. Like, he stays in front of him, gets him to take kind of a tough, like, angle, elbow, you know, not even elbow, like, more at the 45-degree angle where it's just, like, that's a tough shot, and MJ misses it. This is a full-court, time-running-down floater that he also gets up over Divas, Who comes flying at him. And when you watch the replay from like the baseline on it, that's an insane shot. And you're right. It's a top, it never, it never and gets he was, replayed. And he was having a shitty game. He, nothing was going good for him the whole game. That was the other thing. So I, I don't know. It just got lost in history. And then he, then he strips Divac, sends it to OT. By the way, then, OT, did you notice? Did you see who was inbounding with three seconds left of the Lakers, the ball on their side? Magic's inbounding. So now you're yeah, inbounding to Divac, that. Perkins, and you had three seconds left. And, that, and then, obviously, after they screw up that position, it goes to OT. So go ahead. I would have had Magic trying to post up, right, from trying to do a lob past him, spread the floor for him or something. Anyway, OT, uh, it's tied with three minutes left. Scott misses a three. They get the rebound. Magic misses a wide open three. And, and probably because he was, he was tired. MJ comes down and makes just a fucking insane driving reverse layup which you know the baseline I, it's him yeah yeah baseline it's him kobe like a handful of guys who do that as guards. it's like a it's it, like a it's like the dr j deal almost right I mean, it's not as well he does it again later doctor, but it's in that class it, it's coming back because he does it again pippen fouls out perkins makes two free throws it's still tied there's like a little over two minutes left same play with mj they double team him he breaks it does the same reverse baseline Dr. J move, um, which was, I just love because he couldn't make an outside shot. And he's just like, I'm just getting to the basket. Uh, next play, they get a stop. MJ drives down again, does a little lob pass for Grant layup. All of a sudden they're up four. Perkins misses. Levingston, big rebound. Uh, Jordan gets it again, post up, bullies into the lane, gets fouled. They're up six. They end up winning it. He basically... I, I, this is one of the reasons I think this is one of the five most important games of his career. He solves a situation where he's not making shots and he's just like, Hey, I got to win this game. How do I do it? The one time they need him to make a little shot, he makes it. He just starts going to the line, making plays on D, um, and just kind of solves the Lakers in real time. And by the end of that game, you're like, Oh fuck, they're going to win the series. Like you just kind of knew. Whereas a half hour earlier, like, ah, oh, the Lakers are going to win this series. The Bulls aren't ready yet. That's why this is a crazy game, and I can't, play, I can't believe nobody ever talks about it. So on the MJ stuff, because he's still on fire in the first half. Like, he's, he's hitting some shots, and then you're like, okay, he's got to figure this out. We talked about him being subbed out at that point. Both he and Magic are both over 50 minutes. You know how we always look at the start of overtime? Guys are so tired, they started Eldon Campbell at the start of overtime, which is weird because they're just used to everybody like, who are your five? And Pippen had fouled out, by the way, at the end of regulation. So MJ did this in overtime without Pippen. I don't know if right. you already said that. I'm sorry if I'm repeating I think you. he fouled out with like three minutes left in uh, OT. Was when, Are you when he did. That's what I had in my notes. Really? No. Yeah. Ah, uh, I know. I don't. I don't. I think he's. La, I don't have that. I don't have that. Unless I have it wrong. We might have to, we might have to go game log here, which is going to be painful to do. Um. 
Let's agree to disagree. <laughs> We're at the two hour mark. Pippen I know, fouls out well, at some point. I just have I have 92 92 overtime, and then Pippen fouled out, and then I have Paxson's two to make it 94 92. So I, I thought he was out. Uh by the way, what, didn't you think didn't you think John Paxson was this like Steve Kerr three point shooter type? Like he didn't shoot any threes in this game, basically. He made no. one. And in general, this team didn't really shoot threes at all. And at the end of the game in regulation, they're coming out of the timeout right before MJ makes that big shot. And Fratell is like, I like it. They have Hodges out there and packs. I like it. Go for three. Go for the win. <laughs> and it's like, oh, that's why you've never won a title, Mike Fratello. That's the worst idea of all time. How about getting no, you, to Michael Jordan? Um, what I what I loved in, in seeing what was happening here was guys were really tired. Yeah. Like noticeably spent. And that was a big difference between a younger Bulls team that was more athletic and it just an exhausted Lakers team that was so big. And when they got it going, it was just big guys making all these buckets right around the basket. And whenever you hear people, if you're younger, listening to this right now, you didn't grow up with MJ and you hear about like this other gear that he had. And if the only guy you think that had it was Kobe, like this is the kind of game where guys are like, now nah, this is where MJ just goes. All right. Like I can only do this on my own. I'm exhausted. Everybody's exhausted. You know how tired MJ would have to be to miss like two minutes towards the end of a fourth quarter, game three of the finals? That's how tired this guy was. And he finds a way to make those reverse layups in the baseline. And not that you or I needed reminders, but just, you know how when you watch like a jungle cat walk and it's this body control that it's just so smooth. And right. there's just nothing like Jordan in that, his athleticism jumps out in this game that he's he's a guy that's like sort of in another tier. Like early Randy Moss, and you're like, this guy, there should be another league that he should play in above the NFL or Pedro when he was at his peak. We're like, there should be another league above the majors that he's pitching in. That MJ, and we're talking about the greatest player ever, so this should be too surprising, but this unbelievable like coil and body control and explosion, but then to yeah. stay aggressive when the other nine guys are too tired to be as aggressive as he is. Like, this was a willed win. That can be a cliche. It could be used inaccurately. This is a just a perfect example of him doing this stuff where it's just, okay, like, I'm, I'm just going to find a way. And, you know, it's, it's his first title, so we're still talking about him being in his prime athletically, too. I think of those first three title seasons, the two most important games are this game and the Charles Smith game, where that where those performances were just, there's, there's more going on than just the basketball. This game, he's, he's exhausted. He can't make a shot. He still figures it out. The Charles Smith game was really a terrifying situation because if they don't cut that out, now they're down three, two, but game seven's in New York. It's just a bad matchup. They're kind of tired anyway. That's the, it's the third straight. They played a lot of games. The media has just descended on Jordan at that point. And, you feel like there's a chance they actually might break. And then that whole sequence is just unbelievable. The four blocks, poor Charles Smith. Like you're talking about probably the greatest athletic team of that decade. Just wouldn't let him score. Like, yeah, you blame Charles Smith a little bit, but you also have, you have Jordan and Pippen, two transcendent athletes with Horace Grant. And they're just like, you're not scoring. We're, we're not letting you have this. Um, I would show those two games first. If I were like, what were those early bulls teams? Like, cause it's like, not about the highlights. It's, it's the other stuff that made it special. Like you could go, oh yeah, he made six threes in the first half against Drexler. Um, oh, he put up 54 against the Knicks when everybody was bitching that he was at Atlantic city. Like you could hit all of those things, but I just, the sheer will games are my favorites. Yeah. And that's what this one is. And you could, you know, even though I, I still can't understand why they would let him get stuck in the post of Divot so much. And, and magic was just so good in the post at this point in his career, like Jordan couldn't really do anything with him because the size difference is is significant when you see those two guys standing next to each other in the post. But beyond the layups and winning this thing in overtime, just being like, hey, everybody, it's over. What this Bulls team could do defensively when they cranked it up and to see MJ pick up magic the whole time and then run yeah. doubles at him and then the full court press at certain times. And then every time somebody would get kind of caught up with the ball right as they got over half court and the Lakers are trying to get some sort of, the Lakers have so many bad offensive possessions in overtime. There's at one point like a 14 foot Sam Perkins runner where it looks like he's falling down and you're going, 
you know, this is sort of that Daryl Morey thing where I agree with him. It's like, why would I even allow these guys to have the ball in their hands during these major possessions? Like, we can do better than a Sam Perkins runner at 14 feet with him off of the dribble. But that was because the Bulls' defense was clogging these guys up, and it felt like every time that somebody would get close to being trapped, even after they crossed half court, or you've got these guys waving their arms. I mean, MJ sitting there is the best player in the world, and he's waving his arms like a kid on the Hoyas in the early 80s. You know, like, never conceding anything. And every time the pass would be to the sideline, because it would just be like, Jesus, or somebody else take it so we can settle down and get set up on offense. Then Jordan Pippen be just flying and, and deflecting the ball then too. Like how many times do you see in this game where it's a pass to the bench to a Laker and then a Bulls player would just come running over, slash it down, and they would start getting something going the other way. And pace-wise, like the Lakers, this was not some showtime performance. They wanted to beat you in a submission. No, they and- wanted to they wanted to go super slow. Yeah, magic and, back you down. They, they were playing chess in this one. So you're saying more Terry Teagle. That's, that's the you, other you, thing. You, you would have <laughs> let they Terry the, Teagle loose in this game. <laughs> when they uh, when they showed the game, it was game one and two bench numbers. You're like, okay, this Lakers bench didn't have much. AC Green, Terry Teagle, uh, Drew, Eldon Campbell at this point. Michael Thompson, he never even gets into game three. The thing was, A.C. Green was good. They just had too many forwards because they had A.C. Green and Divac. They had Eldon Perkins Campbell. Worthy. And then they had Perkins and Worthy, and it's like you can only play two of those guys at a time. I'm, I'm surprised they weren't able to figure out, like, another shooter. But teams- Byron Scott, Byron Scott not hitting two jumpers in this game may have been the difference, too. Like, to keep keep him honest. And then towards the end, Byron's trying to get one to go down and they're not even good shots. Like I understand he's frustrated, you know, Byron Scott's still scoring like 14 a game. So, and then he got um, hurt. Game, he got hurt at the end of game four. So to where they, and then the series is over. Well, that was fun. The first episode of the rewatch of bulls. Uh, Can I we add, haven't decided wh- which one to do for game two yet for next week yet, but we'll have a good one. This is my last thought. There were no flagrant fouls in this. There's only one sort of collision with Perkins. People made layups. No one was beheaded. There were no deaths. No one retired after because it was too tough. Um, Well, there was an amazing moment in the second half when uh, they called MJ for a push off on a layup. It was a terrible call. And he didn't, yeah, all he did was was stare. It was a bad call. It was a terrible call. And Fratello liked the call. He said it was a good call. One of the other officials was calling it an and one. It was a drive where he just sort of was up and his arms were up and the other guy's head hit his arm. And then the guy changed the call. And, uh, MJ didn't even argue. He stared at him, gave him one of these. There's very little arguing. It's so beautiful to watch. You can actually play 48-minute NBA game and not have to have everybody argue the entire time. But I, I cannot ham- I'm going to say this every time we go back and watch these games. I'm not saying the defense is overrated. The defense of this era is overstated. It's basic. It's guarding less area. But guys actually made layups without broken limbs. And just remember that next time you say that a guy in today's era couldn't handle the physical nature of that game because, honestly, they'd pull up from so far away. They would test him for whether or not he's a witch. We didn't, uh, we didn't talk about Scottie Pippen enough, but we can hit him at another game because he was awesome in this game, too, and one of my favorites. You, Barkley, you loved. I love Pippen. I need to do a big Pippen where I don't say anything the whole time because I'm always – I never can tell if I've – under or overrated Pippen. So I, I need you to do a full Pippen 20 minutes. Maybe we do that next week because I think the second episode of the MJ thing, there's there's definitely a pick a Pippen run in that episode. So we could uh we could do some then. This was fun. The rewatchables. I think this worked. Uh Rosillo, we'll, we can listen to your podcast, the Ryan Rosillo podcast. Uh well you'll have multiple guests. How, how many are you doing? One or two this week? Oh, I think I'm going to do two again, you know, I, whatever I, I, people seem to Why like not? them. Um, I, you know, obviously I have a lot of other projects that are, you know, flying around, but yeah, we're going to have Trent Dilfer on and we talked to him about whether or not he really said two is better than Dan Marino. So I sent him the text be like, do you want to clear this up? And so he's going to come on and, um, also some more NFL draft stuff. We'll have Todd McShann at some point. And you never know, <laughs> big music, big musician guy now. So, um, you know, we're doing, just doing some different stuff, but we'll do a lot of NFL draft coming in the next couple of weeks. So we're good. All right. Good to see you as always. See you next week. Thanks, bud.